in some of your interviews before, you've talked about kind of going from maybe wanting to be an actor because that was in movies to realizing that there was, you know, an author behind movies, you know, and that you know, a filmmaker, then you, that was what you wanted to be. I mean, was it was it a complete, like, coup de foudre, or did, did you just, uh, like, sort of gradually realize, you know, that sort of thing? Because of uh, sort of being forced to uh, uh, experience uh, uh, expression or uh, thought, really, um, in an interior way, because of the limitations I had in uh, 1945 contracting asthma, very severe asthma, I was three years old, uh, which um, uh, negated any, asp any possibility of playing any sports, running or spasmodic laughing that kids do, you know. Um, and so uh, humor became very important to me, uh, storytelling, um, uh, and uh, storytelling from uh, people in the streets, storytelling from uh, uh, family. There was a lot of family. My mother and father, both sides of their family, they're one of, my father, I think, one of seven, my mother, one of eight children, so there are lots of aunts and uncles and cousins and grandparents, a lot of old, who spoke mainly Sicilian. So there were lots of stories, and uh, seems now like a logical progression to be thinking of who I saw on a movie screen or on a television screen acting out or telling a story, and that seemed to be the actor. And so naturally, I would <clears throat> tend, at the age of eight or nine, uh, tend to think that that's who made the movies, you know, <laughs> and that's what I would want to do. The first name that I remember being associated with films that I really responded to was Ford, John Ford, particularly Westerns, and Westerns were at the height at the time. The one that made the biggest impact was these films that I saw made by a very strange sounding name to me, Aaliyah Kazan. And they seemed to really reflect the world I knew or people I knew. You know, we see Marlon Brando and Viva Zapata, but it was nothing compared to On the Waterfront. But it had more impact because Viva Zapata was still a period piece dealing with Mexico and politics and that sort of thing. On the Waterfront was as if uh, they'd put a camera down where I was living. Kazan was a name I saw associated with something that just leapt off the screen and uh, just took possession of me, so to speak. East of Eden was the other one. Not very long after, by the way, the shock of seeing Citizen Kane on television. You first saw it on, on television? television at the, on a million dollar movie. It was shown twice a night, and it was edited with commercials, and the March of Time sequence was edited out. But we didn't know. I am looking at it, I thought it was amazing. <laughs> yeah. And I knew Orson Welles as an actor, uh, having seen him in some other films. The big revelation there was going up to the Thalia Theater uptown New York and seeing Citizen Kane on the big screen for the first time. Or even The Third Man, which I saw on television, having missed it in the theater when I was young. I remember my father was gonna take me because the music was very important, a Third Man theme, and it was played on the radio all the time and I couldn't wait to see it. And then I remember getting sick or something and I couldn't go and I missed it. But I saw it on television and Carol Reed, Graham Greene, Orson Welles, all those things pulled together right around that same time. This is all buoyed up, so to speak, from having been exposed to Italian neorealism at a very young age, and the names I knew there were De Sica and Rossellini. In the late 40s, my father had gotten a television set, I think in 1948 or 49. And uh, at that time, we were living on Corona, Queens but we had to move back to Elizabeth Street in 1950, which was kind of a shock, coming off the Bowery and Skid Row, and uh, it was like suddenly being thrown into the middle of the dead-end kids, um, <laughs> and I wasn't allowed to run or play or fight or any of that stuff. In Corona, they had a, uh, on a Friday night, I remember, there were uh, showings of Italian near realism, Italian films, they put it this way, uh, for the Italian-American community, and at that time, there was only two, I think, stations in New York coming out of New York. There was no transcontinental hookup of any kind, so I think two or three stations. And this was a local station, and they showed Bicycle Thieves and Shoe Shine, and of course, Open City. And the one that made the biggest impression on me was uh, well, Bicycle Thieves and Paisan. I mean, obviously, my grandparents were the same people in the movie. They were speaking the same way. And this was something going on in another place, but the emotion, and the uh, power was universal, and I felt it as a child. I knew it. 
somehow the near realist pictures were movies, but I'm not saying they were truer, but they hit me on another level that I can't really describe. Take my mother, for instance. The only psychology type advice she ever gave me, she said, Murray, eat first. I mean, what kind of psychology? Who, so what, you know? But Joe, uh -uh. I mean, no, it's not him. Something in me made me begin to understand that that could be converted into other styles, or maybe if you tap into the truth of that, maybe you could make films that can maybe touch upon the impact that you felt you saw having your family in the kitchen there in 1949. Did you feel that um, all of the cinema was, was on a continuum? Did you perceive the, the Italian films as being somehow more artistic? Or, no, you not know, more artistic. Is... There, there was a continuum. They're in the same playing field. If you're talking about La Strada or you're talking about uh, Rome, 11 o'clock or whatever, uh, films like that, or Bitter Rice, no, these were not necessarily deemed more artistic. They were maybe more powerful. Mm -hmm. Somehow, there was another sensibility that was different from the Hollywood film. Uh, and that's not denigrating the Hollywood film, it's just, just another aspect of it, and yet it was the same medium. The only way I could start to express how I felt about this stuff, I started drawing pictures, and uh, the pictures became like cartoon strips that I saw in newspapers, but ultimately they became storyboards. The storyboards were a one three, three aspect ratio, I enjoyed it very much when CinemaScope was introduced, and I would do wide frame. Your storyboards and, changed oh, accordingly? Oh, yeah, absolutely, yes. absolutely. Even thread 3D, without, without 3D, of course, putting mm -hmm. little paint, pasting, little hands coming out of the, the paper, you know, that sort of thing. But primarily, when I would show to my friends, I wouldn't show this to many people, maybe a couple of friends of mine, and I would say that uh, now the camera, and then I, I would say that from this frame, we moved here, and they say, Marty, these are just still pictures. I said, no, they're moving. <laughs> They're moving here and in here. Yeah. And now the camera comes around this way. Apparently, I've seen it happen in these movies. They start from there and they go there and then this happens and that happens. Why can't we do that in the pictures in between the lines, the camera's moving or there are cuts, you see? And so I stumbled upon it that way out of desperation. Uh, I also didn't know much about lighting or utilizing a camera. We weren't, didn't have enough money to have a eight millimeter camera. I still don't know much about lighting <laughs> because I didn't grow up that way. I grew up more in, a, in the tenements. It was night, and then it was day. That's it. It was more about hallways and windows and looking out over the city. Sometimes you go up on the roof. That was wonderful. The roofs were wonderful because you could see the city, you know? Did you incorporate those different vantage points into your storyboards? Oh, absolutely, story yeah, absolutely, yeah. Like, here, well, here I'm looking down looking from the down roof. Looking down all the time yeah. from the, primarily from the third floor front, it's in 253 Elizabeth Street is still there. And I would see everything go on through that fire escape from that point of view. And I do like overhead shots that way, or slightly, slightly overhead, you know. <laughs> but the, the panorama of life, uh, good and the bad, all happening right down there like a giant fresco of some kind. But it does come from trying to make sense of where the hell I was and how I would fit in. And the neighborhood was, was the formative time for me, there's no doubt, that Lower East Side, it was, Skid Row was tough. Then the, the uh, derelicts uh, uh, died and sick in the street. And, uh, you would see that as a child. Constantly, yeah. we, with, I became, we became friends with some, <laughs> especially if they were sober and they would do a little bit of work. They'd tell us stories. Oh, the things about World War II, they came from, a lot of them were vets. Uh, we met people that, it's extraordinary. People just went there to die, you know. And then you have uh, the working class community trying to raise their children in a protected way, but it's very hard. Uh, um, and you have the underworld element, which just was a fact. You know, you couldn't tell what it was at first when you were a kid, but... Ultimately, you began to learn, listen, and um, be careful. Uh, it, it was like, a, yeah, that just was what it was. It was an old-fashioned way of it, in terms of that, the old-fashioned uh, organized crime groups, let's say. I don't even know what the family, crime family names were. I have no idea. I mean, I, I do, a number of people have told me, but I've forgotten them. That goes to the show you to the extent in which I was told not to say anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there are names I know I can't say. I yeah. don't remember them. Uh, Every time I try to say them, is a block. 
Would you hear stories about, or were they sort of whispered? We hear stories. Or? No, no, they're, they're, well, whispered, yeah, but primarily it was in the kitchen and the tenement, my father. Eventually, when he began to understand, when I was able to understand certain things, he'd say certain situations, and I would hear him talking to my uncles, uh, his younger brother, who lived downstairs, who was a sort of a, a ne'er-do-well and was always in and out of jail, uh, kind of ultimately became uh, almost like a template for uh, Johnny Boy and uh, the wilder characters in my movies, Kichijiro even, and Endo's Silence. This was regular life. This was daily life. There was always the talk of who was in favor and who was out. Um, sometimes people would just not be there anymore, uh, either, whether ostracized or taken out. We don't know. I mean, or I was told, I don't remember really these things. It was a very real part of life. And it was a part of life where, as in on the waterfront, certain people were locked under, in a way, and didn't have the wherewithal because of their families and because they had to earn a living. Uh, didn't have a wherewithal, or didn't have the education, didn't have the ability, didn't have the connections to uh, break away from this uh, oppression, basically, and had to live um, within it. I, I had to live under it, and that's all there is to it. When he was 21 years old, he decided that he wanted to get married, and he went to my mother, and he, and he, and he married her. And he got married right here in, in the old St. Patrick's uh, Church. Around the corner was St. Patrick's Old Cathedral, first Catholic cathedral in New York. And that gave me a stability in my life. I was sent to the grammar school, the elementary school there, on the corner of Mott and Prince Street. It's now a condo. Is it before or after Vatican II? Before. So it was still all Latin. Latin. Yeah. All in Latin, which I had to learn. And a lot of the older priests were there for the old Sicilian and Neapolitan community, spoke mainly Italian. But they would, in these sermons, were pretty interesting. Even to you as a child, yeah, the sermons yeah, were yeah, interesting. Yeah, because it was about what's right and what's wrong. There was a young uh, Italian-American priest who uh, was his first parish father. Uh, Francis uh, Principe, and uh, he was about in his early 20s, and he made a big difference. He he was assigned to the parish, to the uh, diocese, the, the diocesan priest assigned to the parish, and he took us under his wing, um, and he was a, he gave us a very sort of strong moral sense, uh, and had no qualms about, you know, uh, telling us when we were wrong, or when we were thinking. Uh, uh, in a way that we should, not necessarily shouldn't be, but where it could be steered another way in forming those minds. And a lot of it had to do with literature. He gave us Graham Greene, uh, Dwight MacDonald. I picked up James Baldwin, finally, because it was the beginning of the civil rights uh, uh, action and uh, beginning to understand about human rights. Uh, then I picked up James Joyce, and, and I had you know, problems reading because of the in my... Uh, family, there was not uh, no reading culture. So uh, the books were brought into the house, but it was hard for me to get through them, but I, I tried yeah, everything. Primarily, it was cinema. Uh, it was movies that way. Were you reading about cinema? No, like, there was no, no such thing. No. Uh, when I did try to do papers at NYU or Washington Square College in the early 60s, the only thing I can get in Orson Welles at the New York Public Library was clippings about his um, theater work, which was interesting which was gone, and the War of the Worlds, radio broadcast, and some things that Citizen Kane basically, but not much. You couldn't find really much about, hardly anything, written about film. There were the British critics, Paul Rotha and uh, Roger Manville, people like that, but that was from a distinctly British point of view, yet they were intriguing because many of the films they were talking about no longer exist. I'm talking about incredible detail and in going into uh, a, a minutiae of the silent era those films are mainly gone, nah. you know? But in any event, it, it did skew things another way until we kind of stumbled all the way across and by uh, the early 60s, the French critics picked up and made us understand a little more about American cinema. So at some point, perhaps in your teens, you started thinking that you, this is what you would become, a filmmaker. Um, like after years of hearing the neighborhood stories and doing well, your storyboards and cinephilia. Things that happened that I saw were very compelling. And all of that was feeding into my knowledge and my excitement about the moving image. 
right around the same time, I think it was 17 or 18, uh, I wound up at uh, Washington Square College. Uh, and they had a, there was no School of the Arts at the time, and they had one department called Motion Pictures, Television, and Radio, MTR. And that's when I met Haig Manoogian, uh, Armenian, uh, American, and he was the head of the uh, film department. And he had an enthusiasm and a passion for cinema that just reflected what I felt. And I was discovering as I went along. I would just go up to the Thalia Theater and see this Russian thing called Alexander Nevsky walk in in the middle, you know, and suddenly it's Eisenstein. I go see the Dybbuk, the uh, Polish uh, Yiddish films, Edgar Gielma's The Green Light, you know, and you're suddenly seeing this whole other culture and these worlds through cinema. Television had it too, uh, where they would show foreign films once a week on Channel 9. I saw Pate Panchalia on Channel 9. I saw my first Japanese film, Ugetsu, Mizuguchi's film. Dubbed in English, by the way. Dubbed, it was not subtitled. No, yeah. no. Mm. Some were subtitled. La Belle La Bette was subtitled. Subtitles I found fascinating because you could see how they're really speaking, and that's what they sort of mean, in a way. Oh. But you got the body language going on, you know. And especially because growing up with another language, Italian, um, sometimes I may not understand specifically what they're saying, but I could tell what they're saying. By the time 60 or 61 came around, you're talking of the period of New American Cinema, Jonas Mikas, Stan Brackage, Shirley Clark, so many great people, movies that weren't necessarily what we would know as conventional narrative, but they were narrative of another kind, maybe of emotion, of thought, you know? like moving paintings. So the key here ultimately was when I saw John Cassavetti's Shadows. And that's when I realized that a film could be made. You could do it yourself, so to speak. So the only thing you could do with this new equipment, lightweight equipment coming in from France, uh, the Eclair camera and that sort of thing, was to uh, eschew, so to speak, the style of the Hollywood film and just try to find your own doesn't mean that uh, grainy 16 millimeter black and white is more truthful it just was the only way to do it and taking the lead there as far as what you have to say if you had anything to say at all at that time you could find that as a form of expression it's possible it's very possible and then when we saw shadows absolutely possible i mean i don't i mean shadows i prefer faces i prefer his later films but shadows was the one that just opened the way and then uh, shirley clark did the cool world uh, she did The Connection first, which was rarefied for me, but The Cool World is one that also locked in, and she did that in 35 millimeter, black and white. That gave us the impetus to uh, think that you could actually make a movie. Not only think it, believe it. You know it. You know, not that you believe it, you know it. You just know it. You go and you say, you know you're a director, quote unquote, whatever that means. And people look at me and say, no, pick up that rock, you're a PA. But I'm a director. <laughs> but all right, pick up the rock. You're at NYU, and you, you've seen shadows. You're starting to think, you know, okay, this I have no more. Uh, it's time for me to to get started. Did you did you start out right away wanting to make movies in a particular way, in a particular style, or were you? I think so. The, I think yeah. so. There was no doubt. At first, I was fascinated by the technical side, in terms of making a film. But in terms of what I wanted to express later came to fruition with an attempt at who's that knocking at my door, an attempt at that, it wasn't very successful, but finally came to fruition in Mean Streets. But um, all that was being formulated at the time. But I thought at first, my enjoyment of the versatility of the medium itself, um, the perforations in the frame, what Norman McLaren would do in Canada, and what Godard would do and what Truffaut would do with the surprising use of technique and the breaking of technique, and then ultimately, really, I mean, Warhol did this, but that was a, a separate kind of situation where you'd shoot something for eight hours in one take. Empire, it, yeah. Yeah, okay, that's empire. But the point is that it made you rethink the vocabulary of what movies could be. It doesn't have to go from A to B to C to D. It doesn't have to go from one to two to three. It can start out at three, wind up at six, come back to one. You could do anything in telling a story. Here's something. I want you to see this. Look over here. Here's some pictures of Joe when he was a kid. When he's about six or five, he always used to... And it, right here, it's a picture of him uh, playing uh, uh, yeah, uh, football. That's right, that game. That was his favorite. That's him there with, with the ball in his hand. And uh, that's his graduation shot with the hat. I can go on all day with these things. It's not important. 
that's what's sort of interesting about it. It's not just you, Murray, because you know you can yeah. see like a lot of different techniques and, and styles and things being brought to bear on what's still a, a sort of kind of a recognizable story about your Yes, you know, yes, it was a recognizable story yeah. about people I knew, yeah. mm -hmm. and also recognizable in the sense it was sort of based on, I, I was fascinated by the uh, gangster film genre. It was something that was uh, revered where I came from, and Public Enemy was the key film, really. It was the one that made the biggest impression I saw as a kid on its re-release in 1952, I think. The one that incorporated everything, show business, prohibition, everything, was the Roaring Twenties, Raoul Walsh. So Murray comes out of that, mixed with Fellini, mixed with Truffaut, mixed with all these things. I think part of it was almost like just an adolescent's fun enjoyment of utilizing technique. It's such a playful movie. Playful, it's, yeah, <laughs> in a way. And um, even uh, What's a Nice Girl is the same way, um, but even there, more so about technique. You know, Harry, I don't want to be nosy or anything, but man, she was a real good catch. So I married her. <laughs> Nothing was too good for us. We even had our honeymoon at the New York World's Fair. Unfortunately, it was still under construction. Because what's a nice girl like you won these prizes at these festivals at Brown University and that sort of thing. And it was able to pay some of the tuition and take the burden off my father and mother who were working in the garment district. And so they were all excited by this. And first of all, they thought when I said I was going to make movies, I heard them uh, late at night in the other room. They, and I heard my mother say, I think he's crazy. I think there's something wrong with him. Yeah. I mean, she's probably right. But <laughs> the point was that the adolescent joy of, watch this, now I'm going to turn this upside down, and uh, uh, this frame, I'm going to print, I'm going to draw, I used to draw pictures on eight millimeter frames. You could do anything. It was the enjoyment of learning technique. And as one professor, a very famous professor down there, looked at me one night, he liked the film a lot, but told me, he said, uh, all right, but what you need now is a philosophy. I didn't know what he meant. I was too young. Um, and I think by the time we did Mean Streets, I think it, it, it locked in, uh, that these were, in a sense, regarded as enjoyment, fun, uh, but um, facile. Not easy, not facile is the wrong word, Super, superficial. Murray, I thought, more so, uh, had more to it. It's not just you, Murray. It certainly had more to it. Uh, it, it, de it deals with the first film dealing with, again, trust and betrayal. Joe and me. Friendship, love, life, family. We work hand in hand. Yes, family. I'll tell you, to my family, to my kids, you know, my children, Joe is like a second father. And uh, when it comes to my wife, I mean, I've seen it talked about as maybe, you know, a bit of a precursor to Mean Streets in that there's this central Very relationship. So. Yeah. But it also had elements of um, Bob Hope and Bing Crosby on the road to Zanzibar, a road to Singapore, where one is always being taken advantage of by the other. Mm. Yet there's still the trust, and then a mistrust, and then trust again. <laughs> yeah. it's, it, and so you see that in Mean Streets when uh, Harvey goes in the back room with De Niro, Harvey Keitel and De Niro talks him out of having to pay the debt by explaining what happened, how he lost the money. It's right out of the road movies, by way of Howard Hawks, by way of uh, Cassavetes, who saw that final version and said, don't cut a frame of that scene. He was right. We had been cutting it up, and it was a mess. You know, it was a very different world to go to from where I grew up, which was a, like a little village, in a way. I went to Houston Street on Elizabeth, made a left, and uh, went six blocks west, and it was a new world. It was. Greenwich Village, NYU. Greenwich Village was our campus. Uh, and it was like I was on another planet. And I was certainly out of, uh, out of place, completely out of place. But I was in place here. I knew it. Uh, at, at the same time, when you were going to NYU, you know, so you're like in, in film class and you're learning about, you know, dolly shots and things like that. But um, it was also a super exciting time to be a cinephile, yes? I mean, I think like in one interview I read well, with you, you said it, it felt like there was an exciting movie coming out almost every day. Well, that was know, the point. That... Pretty much when Claude Chabrol's Le Beau Serge opened and kind of announced, in a way, the coming of the French New Wave. That was followed by The 400 Blows, by Breathless, and then it was full-blown. So that almost every week, 
there was a masterpiece, you know, including Rene films, you know, uh, Hiroshima Mon Amour, and then last year Marienbad, which broke all the rules, let alone the Italian cinema, Fellini, the spectacle of La Dolce Vita, which was topped three years later by eight and a half. Eight and a half is about creativity. It's about trying to find that spark of, um, it was called a transcendent spark of being able to create something and him falling short of it ultimately. And then finally coming to terms with himself by the end of the picture. I didn't know that at the time, but I sensed he was out to find something that he, it was always imminent. It was within his grasp and it would always go, he would always miss it. He'd miss it. By the end, he just accepted. Maybe that's the way it has to be. And maybe it will come again. And I saw that, I think, a few, a couple of weeks before I shot What's a Nice Girl Like You at NYU, which was done in a summer workshop of six weeks. Script, although I came with a ready script, pre-production, shooting, editing, and finally printing the film in the lab. And then they would screen it at a little event that they gave. So the Italian cinema had a lot to do with it. Uh, Bertolucci's Before the Revolution, Bellocchio's Fists in the Pocket, Ipugni in Tasca, uh, Olmi's films, I Fidenzati, um, Il Posto, yeah. There was so much, uh, the Russian cinema, Polish films of Andrzej Wajda, very important. Uh, Skolomowski, early Polanski films. Um, all of this was hitting us at once. And in fact, we became, a, let alone Bergman. Every two months he had another masterpiece, you know. <laughs> it was getting annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Brian De Palma would say, another one, damn it. <laughs> and so, uh, this was a, an incredible time. And then late 60s, um, Hollywood changed uh, for a while anyway, uh, with uh, Dennis Hopper and uh, Peter Bogdanovich to a certain extent and, and uh, Billy Freak and, and Coppola, finally. And then by 72, when I was out there, changed again for a few years. But in any event, all that fed into uh, this time, uh, about, about that fed into the, there's a, there's a, how should I put it? Uh, you could not not make a movie. You were going to do it one way or the other. Even if they took the camera away, you were going to find a way. So this was a, a, a real special time. And then to add to all of that, because Bergman, Fellini, great films, Godard, there was a kind of snobbery about American cinema. Yes, and, that's uh, what I was sort of asking about earlier. Yes, like with, yes, for it you, a great it was always snobbery. on a continuum. Yeah, there are very few films I remember of the 60s, late, mid to late 60s, and coming out of Hollywood, that uh, meant anything to my generation. Bonnie and Clyde, basically, was the key that changed everything. And so everybody just sneered at American cinema until Andrew Saris brought over the auteur theory from uh, the French critics. And uh, we went too far that way, but it made us understand that um, in the codification of the films that came out of the Hollywood studios, there was some wonderful art that was created. Yeah. And, uh, you know, then there's the issue of because if it's popular, it's not art or it's not good art. I don't know. I don't know about that. You know, uh, Hitchcock was so popular, it was like a franchise, right? Every year there was a Hitchcock film. That one year this thing, Vertigo, came out, nobody went to see it. It wasn't like the usual, it wasn't North by Northwest, for God's sakes. Mm. Yeah. That was enjoyable. Vertigo was kind of moody. Okay? Yeah. Bad, not dismissed reviews. Nobody kind of liked it. I mean, he was, he was a brand name, though. I mean, he was people, a brand. Like, you know, like my, my parents would tell me about, you know, you'd go to see a Hitchcock like you'd go to see a John Wayne movie or something. Well, it even was, more than you know, that, like, it was almost like it was taken for granted. It was taken for granted. And because it was popular, it was not considered art. And if it was art, it was mediocre. And the, but they ch made us see it a different way. Um, the French critics made us see it a different way, and the English critics really made us see things a different way. Uh, and I was glad that they embraced uh, Ford and Hawks and Hitchcock. Uh, it, that for me, because I, there was something in me as a young student too, because I did love the Italian films and I did love the French films and the Russian films. And I did feel a little funny about liking the westerns and liking the musicals and liking some of the Jerry Lewis stuff and, you know, uh, and uh, there was a tendency to be beaten down by uh, your professors in some cases. Uh, I remember liking so much The Third Man, but Hague Manusian, 
when I wrote it as a term paper for him in the, in the first semester I was there, he sent back a, a B plus. He said, remember, this is only a thriller. Was The Big Shave one of the first movies you made out of NYU? Yes, yeah, The Big yeah. Shave was a film that, uh, after NYU, done Nice Girl, I had done Murray, tried Who's That Knocking at My Door, didn't succeed. Right at that time, I was trying to get films made any which way we could, anything. Myself and my friend Mardik Martin, who just sadly passed away. And Mardik uh, is credited on uh, Mean Streets, he's credited on Raging Bull, he's credited on a lot of pictures. And he, w he was Armenian, uh, born in Baghdad from Iraq. and. Um, we had wonderful times together, and Marduk and I would write anything, anything for anybody, trying to get a picture made. And so there was this kind of a competition at the Palais de Beaux Arts in uh, Brussels under Jacques Ledoux, who's great archivist and uh, cineast, a European. And it was a uh, competition for I think 1,000 feet of Agfa color film with processing. If you come up with an idea and you write it out, they like it. Yeah, you'd get it. And so I came up with this idea of the big shave. Anti-Vietnam War demonstrations were, it was a tough time, it was a crazy time. And I was just between that and the civil rights movements and uh, my own personal life, everything was changing. And so it was a very difficult time. It was the decade of assassinations, the decade of almost like a uh, national suicide in a way. And I thought of that and I had this idea about the, the shaving Maybe it's Bunuel, I don't know. I saw a number, but that really, that, I, the, even if it was Bunuel, the film I saw, La, the uh, Mshian Andalou, the copies were so bad, you couldn't tell what the images were. So it wasn't that, something else happened. I don't know what it was. And I had this idea, and I thought it was really strong. And I wrote it up, and to my surprise, I got the Thousand Feet of Ag for Color, first color film. And I shot it at NYU. A couple of friends of mine at NYU helped, and uh, certainly helped editing and shooting it. And I sent it to Kanok Lezouk, was the festival for experimental film. And uh, Amos Vogel was there. And Amos, um, who had started Cinema, Cinema 16 with Jonas Mikas and all that New York Film Festival. So I got to know him a little bit. Uh, but he was there and he called me and said, the reaction was outrageous. He said he never saw a reaction like that in, a, in an audience. Uh, booing and hissing, laughing throwing things, people were really upset, people loved it, people hated it. He said, I've never seen a reaction like that. And almost Amos has seen most, you know, he even did a, a book called Film as a Subversive Art, which I'm glad to say Big, Big Shave is in there. But in any event, um, I, didn't, I couldn't go there and it, it received uh, La Prix de l'Age d'Or, uh, named after Burnwell and Dolly film. That year was Michael Snow's Wavelength won for the best picture. This is a very, very serious avant-garde filmmaking group. I had, you know, I just got the money to make the film. And, and in 68, somehow I was in Europe. A friend of mine was doing commercials there and he said, come over and, and it was first time there. And I wound up at the Oberhausen Film Festival in Germany, short films, and it was shown there. And Amos was there too. And the reaction was, as he said, and he kept telling me, no, he said, in, 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 he said, at Kanukazuka was worse. <laughs> you missed the best one. <laughs> I said, it was worse than that? He said, yes, this was terrible. He said, I know. <laughs> but, but the humor of the whole thing, when a person and tend to you know, take yourself self-serious, you're so self-serious, and then you got this great idea, and they were laughing at it. It came off as a kind of crazy black comedy. And I, I just horror, but I mean, horror induces nervous laughter you know I didn't know that and I said okay don't say anything just accept that they reacted to it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it's a special film that I, I the others are like juvenilia in a way you're trying this is something you talk about a philosophy of another kind maybe not directly in the storytelling but a sense of a national or cultural suicide now my meatballs are in, I shall put my cover on and forget about it. When I see Italian American, I have a very emotional reaction to, to that film. I, I find it so intensely lovable. Um, 
<laughs> um, it, it's the, well, they were the, lovable. What can I say? Ex, if, yes, really. They really um, were. You know, I mean, it's it's so marvelous to see your mother in the kitchen, like making her sauce almost like through muscle memory. You oh know? yeah, yeah, and that like, just goes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah. yeah. Um, did did you have a job persuading them to to do that? Um, well, by that time, they once the films, the short films, won some. Uh, scholarship awards and things like that. And once I was at Woodstock, for example, as part of that film, uh, films were being made all around. There were other people making independent films. They began to really accept it. And also they were drafted into making. They were drafted into acting in my student films because it's your mother and your father. You, had, you know, <laughs> you need, needed somebody in the frame. Come over here, Mom. Do this for me. And come, oh, how long is this going to take? Because I have to get back. Never mind. <laughs> so in a way, it was like a family project. And then I go here. This is what my mother-in-law taught me. Take a spoon, few spoonfuls of tomato and throw them in here because your meatballs remain very soft. I believe it was a Saturday and a Sunday and it was only three hours each day, and it was 1976, part of this National Endowment of the Arts, something called Storm of Strangers, a half hour show on all the different immigrant groups that came to America, Jewish, Chinese, Amer Italian, et cetera, Spanish. Mine I wanted longer, but it, it was eventually cut down to a half hour, but what you have here is the full version, and the full version was shown at the New York Film Festival. In any event, I decided if they want me to give an impression of the Italian-American experience, because of Mean Streets, I wouldn't do it uh, in a traditional or conventional documentary fashion. So why don't we just go to my mother's and father's apartment and have dinner? And we'll just ask them questions about their lives and what it was like when they were born the year on Elizabeth Street, still living on Elizabeth Street. Mark Martin and I came up with this list of questions and things like that, but the moment we put the camera in the room, it's right there, you see it, and Lee Osborne, who's our sound guy, hit the sink pan the camera over, they started. Okay, was that the light? Where are you sitting? Down there? Why? Why are you? I'm why is he SR. down there? He can do what he wants. Let him do what he wants. SR. Why are you so far from me? Come okay. All right, Get so closer. What? And when they started, I realized that there was no way that I could, not that no way you could control it. You could ask the questions, you could guide it, but what was really happening was something else entirely. And I, this was much more valuable, I thought, because it'd be like everybody having dinner together. Were these stories you had heard before? Was any of it no. new to you? No. A lot of it was, it was new to me. A lot yeah. of it was new. Yeah. There was a couple of stories that I knew, but um, and 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 guided towards them, but uh, many things uh, uh, were added, and many things I didn't quite understand about how many people there were in the three rooms when they were growing up, what a Christmas meant to them, which was more of an Anglo uh, festival, mm, not Italian, or not. I should say not necessarily Mediterranean that way for where they came from, in Chimina, to a certain extent, in Colizzi, Generosa, maybe, these two towns that are still there. And Chimina is a beautiful town in the valley. Visconti shot uh, the leopard there. And uh, Colizzi, Generosa, I believe, Giuseppe Tonatore comes from there. Uh, but in any event, it's a Norman, a Norman uh, castle that's there. It's the ruins of the Normans came down into that area. I didn't understand fully the difference um, in my generation to theirs, who just didn't. It has to do a lot with a sense of incredible storytelling that they have, but also a sense of love that was there. And uh, as if suddenly the cameras disappeared. And this is where everything took place anyway at the dinner table in our growing up. There was no uh, dining room. The kid was kitchen, dinner table, and next right there was a bedroom, and over there was like a a, a seating area. So a lot of people had that now, too. So it's not uh, anything new. It's just that it was very uh, uh, mm, integral to my life. Everything that was around, goes on around the table. And so we just reproduced that. And um, leading to me deciding to make documentaries, because I felt I learned a lot from them about the way she told stories and the way my father behaved. And, and, it took him a while to loosen up a bit, and you could see it. Uh, and that was interesting. And when my mother was able to tell the story, just holding on the frame. And I remember him going to Springfield, New Jersey. At times, we thought, well, in the editing, we'll probably be cutting away to things. But I said, no, don't cut away. I mean, let's just stay with her. And She's stay with such him. a natural. She's natural. Let's stay away. So hence, that was probably the most important lesson I learned 
from the way they spoke and the way they held that frame all the way up to something in Taxi Driver to a certain extent, and certainly in Raging Bull, and not in the fight scenes, of course, the other scenes, <clears throat> and then uh, up into uh, Silence and, and uh, Irishman, Italian-American. Became like a companion piece to Mean Streets. Mean Streets is a darker side, there's no doubt. And then that led to, in Taxi Driver, for example, the counterpart to that was uh, the American Boy, but that had to do with a world that I was getting into in terms of almost like stand-up. I was spending a lot of time with stand-up comedians, and they would go all night, usually, in New York or L.A., and I wanted to capture some of that and whatever it meant, the best and the worst of it. And it was almost like capturing a moment in time, which I think a lot of people could say, oh, I have friends like that, or we do that, we did stayed up all night, we told stories, there were drugs or there was this, there was alcohol or whatever. And imagine, you know, if you were there, it was so funny, and then you tell the people the story and it wasn't funny. This could be funny. <laughs> this is funny, but it's, a horror, it's also a horror film in a way. Mm. Um, so it's funny. Um, and uh, storytelling, and it gets darker and darker and darker. I find that documentaries, or if you call them nonfiction, first of all, they're films. I don't, I don't call them, you know, nonfiction, fiction. They're all films. In fact, with documentaries, I often feel I find it much more sometimes emotionally compelling. Maybe that has to do with the impression the Italian neorealist films had on me when I was five years old. It seemed real, but I knew it was a movie, but it was real. That's it. And mm. so the, the documentaries were always being made by me as kind of um, counterparts to, not counterparts, companions to the features. It really is how to tell a story in a different way. Again, different form, which in the case of Bob Dylan, No Direction Home, but particularly in the case of George Harrison, uh, living in the material world, and, and, and ultimately the Rolling Thunder, conjuring the Rolling Thunder review. These documentaries and the ones on Fran Lebowitz, uh, public speaking, and the ones we're doing now, they all found their way into, I'd say, oh, departed Wolf of Wall Street. Silence to a certain extent, and ultimately uh, Irishman. It was a breaking of form and uh, particularly Rolling Thunder Review, where I don't know what it is, quite honestly. <laughs> you know, it's a film, a document, it's a film, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a conjure, it's, a, it's an act of conjuration, you know? Um, and so, in a way, uh, it's how to create something that's mysterious and is not locked into um, uh, sanctioned forms, so to speak, the expected, and to force yourself to think differently. And that's why I keep making them, or try to. Is that enough? <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you.